The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by, the, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I declare unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas above uh, then uh, of the twelve, and after that He was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part unto this present, but some are um, part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one, as of one born out of due time. This is one of the most wonderful chapters in the whole Bible, in my opinion. It speaks of the hope that we have in Christ. The hope that we have is that Christ rose from the dead and we will rise also one day. When our body is laid in the ground, that is not the end. That is just the beginning for a Christian. We have a new life promised to us, a new body and a home eternal. We're going to have a word of prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help me as I preach. Lord, uh, help my voice. Help me, Lord, to be filled with your spirit. God, fill me, use me, God, and do what I cannot do. Help every mind and heart for just a few minutes focus upon the powerful, important, all-important truths of the Word of God today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the beginning of this chapter, we find the definition of the good news, of the gospel. The gospel is very simple. The world likes to confuse it. They like to make it difficult. The greatest trick of the devil, especially in this world today, where you have all these Christian denominations and all these Christian religions out there, uh, but in, in even the world religions, even the, if you go outside of Christianity, they pretty much all seem to teach one basic thing, and it is not good news, it is bad news. If I have to work my way in, if I have to merit my salvation, if I have to do anything other than believe in Jesus Christ, if I have to turn over a new leaf, that is a works-based salvation, and I have no hope of making it in. But I want to tell you something. Jesus died on the cross. He did all the work. Every single sin that I've ever committed, that you've ever committed, was nailed upon him in his body. He bore our sins on the tree, my friends. And I want you to understand that he died and he laid for three days and three nights. And then he rose victorious over the grave. And my friends, he is the resurrection and the life. And anybody who believes in him, uh, they will live forever. Their body may die that's not a problem for God he Jesus rose up and by the way he said we'll rise also and my friends but the thing that we have to do and understand the gospel is that Jesus died that Jesus paid for our sins that Jesus rose again we have nothing to do with that the Bible tells us that we must believe the gospel the gospel is simple we trust put all of our faith it's not that we merely assent to a fact the grass is green and the sky is blue. But no, we put all of our faith in Jesus Christ. We trust in Him alone, rejecting other gods, other religions. Buddha is not going to save you. The Pope is not going to save you. Muhammad is not going to save you. Allah is not going to save you. Only the resurrected Jesus Christ is going to save you, my friends. The only one that has ever rose from the grave victorious. Well, I'll say it this way. There have been some others that have rose, risen up from the grave but did you know that Jesus is different than every other person that's ever rose up from the grave by the way those others who've risen up from the dead those people died again those people uh, were raised by God's power but Jesus will Jesus did not ever die again he's still alive and he's coming back for us one day what a beautiful truth there's a lot of people we could talk about you know, Elijah, God showed his power through Elijah to raise the widow's son in 2 Kings. In Matthew, Jesus raised the lady from the dead. In, Jesus, in Luke 7, Jesus raised the only widow, son of a widow. In Luke 7, uh, it talks about that. In John chapter 11, Lazarus was raised from the dead. And in Acts 9, Peter did a miracle and raised Tabitha from the dead. And there are others who rose from the dead. 
on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, there were other graves that were opened and people came forth alive. It was another miracle. It's an amazing truth, an amazing truth. But those people, you know, they didn't, you know, they, they, they shouldn't have sold their, their tomb or their grave site because they, they were going to fill that once again with their mortal body. But Jesus rose immortal. I want to go through just a few verses here. The difference between these resurrections and Jesus' resurrection was that these folks died again, but Jesus rose the third day in the power of an endless life. Let me read to you this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 4, it says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. In Revelation 1, 17, it says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid at his right, his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive. Listen, forevermore. Forevermore. I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. You want to get saved? You want to go live forever? It's not going to be in, in, in uploading your consciousness to Elon Musk's computer or joining up with Jeff Bezos and, and all of these type of people, my friends. Jesus is the only way to have eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, by the way, was literal. It was bodily. Jesus didn't rise up just in spirit like the Jehovah's Witnesses say. It, say. His body was hung on a tree. He voluntarily gave up the ghost. And they took his body down from the cross. And Joseph and Nicodemus reverently laid his precious body in that garden tomb. He was dead and buried, it says in John chapter 19. In Isaiah 53, 9, it says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with that rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. It is, physic it is important that we understand that Jesus' death was, and his resurrection was bodily. He was buried and he resurrected physically. This is so important today for us to understand. In Acts 2.31, the Bible says, And he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. In John chapter 2, verse 19, it says, uh, <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then said the Jews, Forty and six years this temple uh, was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up again in three days? But he spake of, of the temple of his body. It was a bodily resurrection. This is important because we have to understand uh, and believe this in order to be saved. That Jesus bodily rose from the dead. You say, what's the big deal? Well, the Bible says this in Romans 1.16. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel is, in 1 Corinthians 15, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, have, how many of you have seen the Jehovah's Witnesses with their little stands out on the streets? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And they love to come out at this time of year. They love to come out and pretend like they believe in Easter. But they do not believe in Easter, my friends. Did you know that? They like to make a big deal about it. But here's the thing. Uh, you know, I'll tell you this. They talk, they, they're all about it. They'll say, well, Jesus gave his life and all of this. But they're trying to peek, uh, they're trying to, to get the weak and, and the people who don't know their Bible. Because here's the thing. They do not believe in a physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus' spirit rose from the dead. You know what your spirit leaving your body is? That's not called a resurrection. That's called dying. The Bible says this for a Christian and willing to be rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The minute you die, your soul leaves your body to be forever with the Lord if you're saved. It's a total false religion. But they try to sound so credible at Easter time. And the fact is they don't believe in Christianity in the slightest. Jehovah's Witnesses, are it's a cult. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, they, they don't believe in the, they don't even believe he died on a cross. They can't sing the old rugged cross because they believe, it, they believe it was like a torture stick or something. And the reason I bring that up is because it's the gospel that we have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus is God. God manifested in the flesh to take away the sins of the world. That he died, was buried, and that he rose again. 
You don't bury a soul or a spirit, by the way. They buried Jesus' body. His body rose from the dead. If someone does not believe that, then they are not saved. His body rose from the dead. It was the same body, but glorified, immortal, incorruptible. Let's look at 1 Corinthians, and we're going to jump down to verse number 20. I want you to see this. The bodily resurrection of Jesus uh, Christ here. And if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we put all our faith in Him and what He did for us, God provides that same bodily resurrection for each and every one of us. I love this passage. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since at, and by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of de uh, death, the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, amazing truth here. Adam sinned in the garden, but Jesus came and did no sin so that we could have eternal life. The Bible goes on to explain the nature of our resurrection and the nature of Jesus' resurrection. And by the way, he also explains the second coming of Jesus Christ here. Notice verse, let's go down to verse 35. But some man will say, How are the dead ra raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, uh, that, no, uh, that, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that, thou, uh, that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear a grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it pleaseth him and to every seed his own body. Now here's the concept. The resurrection is being explained to us in agricultural terms. I do a little bit of gardening, and so I can get this a little bit, but I'm not a farmer or anything, not yet. <laughs> but uh, the word sow here means, uh, is the same word as what we would talk about planting. And basically it gives us, if you take a, a, the ideas of put the seed in the ground, and then, then part of that seed dies, and that, so that new life can emerge. And that's why it says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. The main body of the grain decays, that it may become food and nutrients for the tender germ that will produce a new plant. Now when somebody dies, a physical body dies, and we bury it in the ground. Now it's very common for people to incinerate the bodies. We'll, we'll you know, we'll say it that way. But uh, today, but the the picture uh, is the reason Christians we're not like we're not doing pagan, you know, burning people on a pot, a, a pyre or whatever. We we put people in the ground because this is why. Because our we are are like buried in his likeness we're put into the ground like a seed that's being planted in the earth but the amazing truth for a christian is is when our seed goes down into the earth our body goes it's laid in the earth we're gonna just like when you put a plant a seed in the ground and then a plant arises you and i are gonna rise one day the seed and the plant are two different things and the seed itself does not produce a giant seed it produces a new life it produces a beautiful tree or a plant. You put an acorn in the ground, you don't get a giant acorn, do you? You get a beautiful oak tree. And Jesus' physical body, he died. He was raised from the dead. But his new body resembled his old body, but it was different than his new glorified body. It was a special glorified body. And the Bible even tells us in John chapter 12, verse 23, it says, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. But verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. But here's the great beautiful thing. First John chapter 3 says this, Beloved, we, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Listen to this, my friends. But we know that when he shall appear, when the Lord comes back, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. I want to point out to you, this is why Christians have typically buried their dead. This is, it's a beautiful picture. It's not a sin, I don't think, to cremate somebody. But this, you know, God knows where people's remains are. It doesn't, it's not a problem. You could have your ashes thrown out over the Atlantic Ocean and he'd, he'd get them all back on Resurrection Day. A new glorified body. No problem. But the burial is a beautiful picture for a Christian. 
because just like you plant that seed and a beautiful tree comes up, we're coming up to new and glorified. Notice, let's go down in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 42. Here's the beautiful, another beautiful truth. When we arise from the dead, we're not going to be like this old body. We're going to be a new glorified body. Verse 42, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. <laughs> it is raised in incorruption. Praise the Lord. You know, sometimes I'm just in my middle age, but I'm hurting sometimes. But praise God. I'm not going to, we're not going to have that anymore. Incorruptible, incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. I mean, it's sad to see somebody. I remember talking to a man and he said, you know, one of the hardest things for me is to see my strong dad. He was telling me, my dad is so, so strong, but as he's gotten into his 80s, he said he's gotten weaker and weaker. It's been so hard for me to see that and eventually passed. But my, my friends, we, we start out weak, we end weak. The Bible says this, it is sown in weakness but it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And then he, he goes on to explain that beautiful spiritual body, my friends. The body, physical body decays. It falls apart, some quicker than others. <laughs> it's weak. It's, it's corruptible. But that new body is the one that we're going to inhabit for all of eternity. Somebody said, when we've been there, um, you know, 10,000 years, right? Or what's it going to be like a million years from now? But listen, here's the amazing truth, is that when we get up to heaven, I think we're going to be outside of time. It's not even going to be about millions and billions of years up there. It's just we're there. I, I can't even wrap my head around it. Jump down to verse number 50. I'm just hitting the highlights and we're almost done. This, I, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Now, many Jehovah's Witnesses will twist this verse and they'll say, flesh, see, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So Jesus must have resurrected uh, spiritually. He, he didn't actually rise up with a body. But here's the problem in Luke chapter 24. And that's a, a ridiculous argument because seeing that this verse is the very end of a long explanation of how we're going to be a body. We have a, a, this natural body and a spiritual body. Not a spirit, but a spiritual body. The, that is what's provided for us at the resurrection. But notice, it's flesh and blood that cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In Luke 24, it says this in verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus stood himself in the midst and uh, said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet. Do, does a spirit have hands and feet? He says, Handle me. That, that is, is myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit cannot have flesh and bones as you see me to have. Now, Here's the thing, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But did you know flesh and bones can? Flesh and bones can. The resurrected Jesus plainly says that he's not a spirit. He says, handle me. He was standing before them. He said, I'm not a ghost. You see, flesh and blood will not enter the kingdom of God, but our spiritual body, I guess it won't have blood. It won't need blood. We'll just live forever. The life of the flesh is in the blood down here. But something else is going to sustain us. This old body surely need, need, needs blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. But that new glorified body. I'm almost done. Jesus physically died and was buried and resurrected. In Acts chapter 3, the Bible says this. And I, I'm not going to take much time here. But there's so much evidence for the resurrection. The Bible says this. Oh, the former treatise I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he had, it, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them, uh, of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Luke here uh, reminds them of these infallible truths, these proofs 
the, these things that are very clear and evident. Enough people saw Jesus that it is clear that he raised from the dead. Think about this situation. After Jesus died, the disciples were disheartened and discouraged. In Acts 1, Jesus says, listen, wait for the Holy Spirit for you to, co to come upon you. And these Christians, they saw this. And, and imagine, imagine them watching Jesus die on that cross and knowing that the Jews and the Romans and everybody was out to get him. And they hated Jesus so bad. But these very people turned the whole world upside down. You know why? Because they knew that death couldn't touch them. They saw Jesus put to death and rise again. And my friends, death can't touch us. My friends, we shouldn't be afraid of plague or sorrow or death. My friends, we have eternal life in our soul. She's, we have eternal life springing up. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to hit finish out here. What does this all mean for us? First Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Jesus was the first of the immortal, e eternal, resurrected bodies. For since by man did came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The Bible then goes on to talk about the resurrection that we're going to have. And he says, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, they which are Christ at his coming. My friends, Jesus is coming back and we're all going out of here. We're going to meet the Lord in the air to be there forever with the Lord. And I'm going to close out with this verse to, to finish my sermon this morning. Verse 51. These verses here. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. And so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Say it with me. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus, through the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, here's the admonition to those of you who are saved today. How many of you are saved today? Would you say amen? Amen. 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 Listen to this. My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why, what, what's going what's gonna to separate us from our Lord? Death? Let's, let's, I told you that was our last verse. Turn to Romans 8. But I just feel led to do this real quick. Verse 35, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? There's trouble coming, my friends. In this life we shall have tribulation, Jesus said. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Shall persecution or distress, got those backwards, or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted for, as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You know what a more than a conqueror is? That's, I, I think it's somebody who cannot be conquered. We can't be conquered because God has conquered death, hell and the grave. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us 
from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. Jesus has paid it all. He did all the work. I think I've preached it to a saved crowd today, but if you haven't trusted Christ as your personal Savior, I'd like you to shake my hand and talk to me after the, after the, the message. But I'd like you to bow in a word of prayer. And just for a moment, I want you to think. I'm going to take, just give you a few minutes, just a minute here to think about the Lord and what He's done for you. I want you to thank Him for dying. Thank Him for resurrecting from the dead. Thank Him for doing what you couldn't do. Thank you for taking uh, the punishment so that you wouldn't have to spend an eternity in hell for your sins. And I want you to thank Him for just a minute. I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to do the same thing. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we're humbled by the truths of the Word of God today. Lord, without you we can do nothing. And Lord, we're here because of you. This humble group of people, Lord, we love you with all our hearts. We want to serve you, God. You rose from the dead. Lord, it is our most reasonable service to give our lives a living sacrifice to you. So the best we know how, God, we go out into this world and try to reach people with the glorious gospel that they don't have to die and spend an eternity in hell. We want to give them the word of the, of, of the truth, Lord, that they might be saved. Lord, help us to stay humble and stay right with you because of what you've done for us. Thank you. Help us to be resolved no matter what comes in our life. Lord, because that you rose, you died, you conquered everything. You've made it very easy for us. Help us to conquer our flesh, Lord, in this life, to overcome our foolish pleasures and lusts and desires that war against our soul. And I pray that we would live and walk in newness of life. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord, also bless this food, this breakfast that's been prepared for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. God bless you for being here.